Hello and welcome to a new episode of Other Record Labels. I'm your host, Scott Orr, where we talk about the art and culture of running an indie record label. Today is a really special episode. Um, we, you know, we have on the show is a, a label by the name of Oh Boy Records. And, and I don't know if you're familiar with Oh Boy Records, but you certainly are most likely familiar with John Prine. And, and John Prine started Oh Boy back in the 80s. And we, we chat about this because it's really special. Because John started this at a time back in Nashville when uh, running an indie label was just not the thing to do. Uh, it, it was much more coveted to get signed to one of the majors. And so we talk about what that was like uh, back then. And, and of course, we talk about uh, what the future is like for the label since John's passing in, in 2020. So this is a really great interview with Colin from Oh Boy Records. I'm excited for you to hear it. Before we dive in, make sure you visit our website. There's some new resources that I've been working on. And of course, the new book that just came out last week, make sure you check that out. Go to otherrecordlabels.com and grab our toolkit. If, you, if you're you know, one of, a new listener and, and you want to hear the story of, of John Prine and, and Oh Boy Records and how he started that record label, um, we have a resource for you that's free that will be helpful for anyone who is um, taking on that task of starting a record label or even just thinking about starting a record label. And I put it all together in this toolkit called the Record Label Toolkit. You can get it at otherrecordlabels.com slash toolkit. It includes um, a sample recording contract to see what one of those looks like, a spreadsheet um, for accounting purposes, as well as some checklists and a workbook and a couple of coupons and lots of other things. So go to otherrecordlabels.com slash toolkit to grab a copy for yourself. Oh, that's, I bet that was an awesome show, man. It was great. Talk, yeah, it was really good. I was underneath the I show. was underneath the balcony and I felt like it was a bit of a bass trap. So that, I was kinda, yeah, that can that can be a little tough. I people say there's not a bad seat at the Ryman, but I don't know yeah. why. No. Because no. they're definitely <laughs> Yeah. And I mean I saw um I saw uh the Moody Blues and they had these like wild, like huge, like screen visuals. I could not see any of Yeah, that. right. <laughs> and I, I was like <laughs> well, yeah, I think people, so we have a, a venue in town, uh, in Toronto called Massey Hall, which would be very similar to, I mean, it's probably similar age to the Ryman and it's just, uh, like a historic venue and, um, it's, people say the same thing, not a bad spot in the house, but that's totally a lie because there's pillars just very much like the Ryman. So it's like, if you're sitting behind a pillar, that's, That's a bad, a bad scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's total BS. <laughs> Let's dive into this because um, I was sure. doing a lot of research um, this morning and it was uh, such a history. I'm so excited to talk to you about this. And I mean, obviously we're going to talk about the story of John Prine and, and I want to get into that, mm -hmm. the whole history in a minute. But yeah. I mean, with John passing away uh, mid-2020 last year, um, what what was his goal for the label? Was his goal for the label to continue after him? Was that was there a sense of was there any sense of doubt for you guys uh, right after he died? No, uh, -uh. that's no, great. There, there, yeah, there really wasn't. Um, you know, John was handpicking these artists that we've signed in the last um, you know three four years. Oh yeah, he was so, really involved with that process. He was. Yeah, I mean, you, you could you could say that you know. John was picking those, you know, everyone who we've signed. Wow. Um, and that was the case pretty, pretty much uh, throughout as far as I know. Um, but since my time at Oh Boy, that's definitely been the case where John was heavily involved um, and was the final say in picking um, an Oh Boy artist. Mm. So because of that, you know, that in and of itself just, um, you know, led to us just continuing on with with those artists because yeah. that's just John's legacy living on. Um, that's clearly what he wanted to do. Um, but we, you know, I don't think there was any doubt that we would continue signing more artists in the future sure. um, and continue putting out, you know, the artists who are on our labels records. No, that that really, I don't, I don't, you know, it didn't cross my mind at least. Um, and I, I think, I think with the way John had set it up, this is. Uh, you know what he wanted. I imagine that for a company like this, and for a, a, a character like him, that he probably um, passed on his ethos so well over the years. Very much, I imagine, like Steve Jobs. You know, where mm. you guys could go forward signing people that you know he would he would have loved. Right. Yeah. There's there's certainly some truth to that. I mean, the the whole business is is 
sort of family run at this point almost. Mm. Um, myself and Eileen and Sophie, um, who we just brought on this year, um, everyone else is in the family. John's manager was his wife, uh, Jody, um, who's our director of operations. He is John's uh, stepson. Wow. So yeah, so, every, so you know, cool. it's, it's definitely a family run business. So if they're, you know, any anything that was not left you know, directly to me or Eileen or anyone who's involved in, with Oh Boy, you know, it's already there because it's, you know, a lot of it's in the family, mm. which is really great. When we talk about these ar- artists that you've signed on the label, uh, how yeah. how does a record label that is founded by such an iconic artist, how do you pull your other artists out from his shadow? You know, um, I think John was always looking for just like incredible songwriting. That was, mm. that seems to be the that makes sense. thread that runs, um, uh, you know, amid all of our artists is this knack for writing like uh, songs that are true, writing songs that, you know, resonate with people. I think that was, you know, his, his interest in music, um, the, in, in my experience that I got to talk to him about almost always had to do with songwriting. Now, if he was talking to maybe, his guitar player, I'm sure it might've been a different conversation, mm. but it was always, um, you know, it was always songwriting and he's always been a huge, um, huge fan of good songwriting. And so I think that when it comes down to it, if, if you had to tie a thread between all of them, it would be, um, you know, the artist's ability to write a song or write about, you know, an everyday experience mm. in a different way or in a way that rings maybe a little more true than, um, the, you know, the competition. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that, that was how, that was how John, um, always picked him out and Jody, um, worked, worked with John really closely. And, and I think probably Fiona did too. Um, and they all kind of would put their heads together and Jody might find an artist and show him to John and John, it would resonate with John. And so that would move that conversation along more. So, I think it was in that way, it was sort of that, that family effort, uh, where Jody knew what John would like and, um, would present stuff to John or, sure. you know, could versa. What an incredible blessing for a songwriter to be, you know, at, at a point in their career to be tapped by John Prine and kind of, you know, res- <laughs> yeah, I know. That's incredible. I know, man. I, it, it, I, you know, getting to see, uh, you know, with, with Kelsey, Trey, Arlo, getting to see them just light up and be so psyched was so much fun. Um, Arlo got like an oh boy tattoo. Uh, oh. that's like, it's, it's like real big on his forearm. Um, <laughs> you know, pe- people were just, uh, you know, the, the, the artists we signed have just been so psyched and getting to see that is awesome. Yeah. Uh, Cause John's really involved when they, you know, um, I don't know if you're familiar with like the basement in Nashville. It's like under Grimey's records. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Grimes. Yeah. Sorry. I've been to yeah, Grimey's. Grimey's sure. you would have been to. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, Trey Burt played there and John came and sat in the front row oh. of this, you know, tiny little venue, the basement for the, like his first show, wow. um, when he signed to us and, you know, Trey still talks about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Just that all of those ingredients together exactly. would be pretty But memorable. it was, it was really important to John, um, to, to make those artists feel welcome and to all of us. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a little family. It's getting to be a, a bigger family for sure. But, um, that's that's important to us, and that was that's been important to John, seemingly throughout all of Oh Boy's history, um, but certainly the time that I've been here. Okay, so as we're talking 2021, I think you are at 40 years. Is that right? 40 years, 2021. Unbelievable. Exactly. Uh, so, can yeah. you give me a, a history of the label? Can you take us back? Sure. So, we are actually the second oldest artist-owned independent label in America. Wow. Um, I think that's, yeah, I think that is confirmed. What's the, the first? 70th. The first is um, Fugazi's record label. I can't oh, think of the okay. name. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, and it was, it was. Um, we almost had the first longest running, but then uh, I think Fugazi or someone put a record out on the label after like 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> we were kind of bummed. We were like, oh man, <laughs> we're so close. Uh, oh, that yeah, is so, really interesting. So, yeah, isn't that wild? I I, I love home. I love that fact. Yeah, well, forty um, years but, is a long time. I, like you know, I've had I've had old labels like twenty five years, and I've had thirty mm-hmm. years. Um, but yeah, forty is that's pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. It John, I think 
I mean, at the time, I think it was pretty revolutionary. I don't, you know, I don't think anyone really was doing that. It's That's not right. In, and I, not in his genre for sure or in his world. And a lot of it came from, um, I think he felt like the labels didn't really know where to put him. Um, okay. And he was frustrated with that because the major labels he was on kind of shuffled him around and didn't quite know where he fit with the rest of everyone. Oh, um, yeah. That's so interesting because yeah. I think Johnny Cash was experiencing the same thing around that same mm, time, mm-hmm. right? You know, as as rock and roll came in and and and, uh, and that country and Western sound, that maybe there wasn't a place for it. That's very interesting. Right, right. So, yeah, he, he felt like they didn't really know where to put him. And he had, you know, he had been touring and sort of gathered this cult following at that point. Um, you know, this is... 1981 when it came out so he was about to put out aimless love so he you know um bruce orange had already come out and had you know kind of was this um uh you know rise of his success again um so sorry and- how many rec- um how long was he uh, what what labels was he with prior to starting his own so label? he started on atlantic okay and his first three records were released on atlantic and then after that he um he released with another record label that's escaping me right now. Um, Asylum, I think. Asylum. Yeah, yeah okay. Asylum. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. And um, then... And then... His contract Aimless was up? Love was the first LP on Oh Boy Records. Interesting. Okay, and yeah, so... Yeah, but before that, what, what's, what's really interesting yeah. about how he started it, uh, him and his manager, Al Bonetta, decided to do this. And the way that they decided they do it is they sent out a letter to a bunch of his fans, essentially like the first crowdfunded <laughs> record I'd, I'd, I've ever heard of at yeah. least. So he sends this letter out that's like, hey, we're going to do a Christmas record with Silver Bells and I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus, seven inch, uh, seven inch record, and we'll send it to you. You you send us the money now and we'll send it to you. So OBR001, oh, the catalog number, is a seven inch split of... Uh, I saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus and Silver Bells. Oh, wow. I heard about yeah. that. That's incredible. <laughs> and so that was how it started. And then... He didn't it, write that, um, right? That's Dolly Parton. Did he write that? No. Oh, yeah, okay. no, no, no. Okay. He didn't write either of those songs. Okay. Um, and then Aimless Love came out. And that was that was the, the next release. Um, and that was his first uh, LP that was released on... Oh, Where did Boy. he get the mailing addresses of his fans? Was it, was it a MailChimp account? <laughs> Good yeah, probably not a Mailchimp account. Not at that point. Uh, um, I imagine, you know, he, he was That's he, he toured like crazy. Um, so I imagine that it was probably from touring. Unbelievable. Um, I, I'm sure. I know. You know. I know. Al Bonetta was particularly um, uh, detailed in in those sort of things. Sure. So I'm sure that he had gathered at least something. Um, but you know, I, I imagine that it probably was from touring. But I'm not. I'm not sure. So where he would have gotten all those names, but it was enough to start a record label. So it must have been significant. Yeah, that's interesting. And so when he put out the Christmas um, seven inch, was he planning on starting a record label? Was he testing the waters, or was it just for that seven inch? No, he was planning on starting a record label. Yeah, he he wanted to start Oh Boy Records. Wow. Um, that was the yeah that was the idea, and it was you know I think at first it was just to release his music, but I think. The intention was to eventually release other artists um, from the beginning. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, what's crazy about what we're talking about, and, and, and uh, you know, I obviously wasn't around at this time, but I, I well, I, I think I was around. Yes, I was. I just arrived. <laughs> but um, I, I'm thinking about, as we're talking about, you know, this guy who wants to self-release his own music, and buck the trends and start his own record label. Saying that in 2021, it it doesn't, nobody flinches, right? Because we all do that. Um, But back then, that would have been incredibly polarizing, incredibly brave. Um, Gosh, I I just can't imagine what that would have been like to say, I'm not going to sign with, you know, these labels who who would have completely controlled the industry. And I'm going to do it on my own. I mean, that's just incredible, right? It, it. I think it was big news in the music business, as far as I know. 
Oh, at the time. I think, I mean, I, I do think it was, um, I do think it was a big deal. You know, we we're actually working on a documentary right now, which there's a trailer out that just came out yep. um, yeah. at the beginning of this week. Yeah, exciting. Uh, and so there was there's some news articles that you can see. Um, I think probably billboard and stuff like that. So I think it, I think it did kind of make a splash in the music business um, in the beginning. And you know, I think. Toby Keith is someone who said that he took uh, direct influence from John to do his own wow. thing. Wow. Um, yeah. So I think it, 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 it people were, people are, were aware of it. Now, I'm not sure when Toby Keith started, but um, I bet it was, you know, the 90s. Right. Right. So, yeah. I mean, I think, I think people were, uh, I think people were listening and, and, you know, it, it, it was, it was a pretty big deal at the time. It certainly, um, didn't seem like anyone else was doing it. And like, you know, you you look at, we mentioned Fugazi had the first one. We're like, that's punk rock, you know? Sure. Um, yeah. I feel like that, <laughs> that mentality was not in the folk scene. That's right. Um, yeah. At the time. Totally. And, you know? Yeah. Uh, certainly not at the time, maybe in like the 60s, but. And so um, did he stay independent you know, for, like he stayed with Oh Boy all the time? Like, it, was there was there ever offers after oh, that? There were, yeah, there were a lot of offers, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I don't know the details of all of them, sure. um, but there were certainly offers about Oh Boy for John to release stuff on another label, a major. Sure. Um, yeah, but no, he, 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 he did not. He released everything after that on Oh Boy that he put out. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. we're, we were talking about Nashville at the beginning. Are there other record labels in Nashville today that are similar to you guys, like completely independent or, or, or other artists, um, maybe not necessarily from the same generation, but who have, uh, kind of taken that flag and, and ran with it. Well, uh, the, you know, the big one at the moment uh, that comes to mind would be third man. Um, yeah. Okay. You know, that's a good point. Obviously with yep. Jack White, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, they've, they've been wildly successful. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, that, that one, that one comes to mind. Um, I I don't think I know of any other ones off the top of my head, specifically like artist owned independent labels. I mean, there's lots of indie labels here in Nashville, but um, as far as artist owned labels, um, there's one uh, a Acorn that I think David Rollins and Jillian Welch. Oh, okay. Either own or take ownership in. Interesting. Um, or it could it could just be their studio, but um, yeah, I would what, say it's more common. They, they for release records. More common for artists to come up to have their own studio, you know, to say yes, I own that's, the that's studio. Super yeah, common here. yeah, so yeah. Exactly. But as far as artists owning a label, um, other than Third Man, I, I, I can't, I can't name one off the top of my head that I know of. Yeah, that, that's that really, stand out. That's really interesting, man. Yeah, I would just love to go back in time and 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 to kind of see what that reaction would have been like, right. um, you know, just because of what the gatekeepers must have been like, and um, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I can imagine a lot of people probably thought it didn't work. It wasn't going to work. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I imagine there was probably some, this guy's crazy. What What do they think they're doing? Right, right, right. <laughs> I So talk to me about the documentary. I mean, that's that's really exciting. I, I did get to see the trailer. Um, and I mean, that made a lot of, uh, that made a lot of news. I mean, at the time of yeah. recording this a couple of days ago. Right, right. Um, yeah, it got it got kind of picked up everywhere, which was cool to see. Um, it, it's it's going to be fun. I'm I'm excited about it. It's you know it's going to be a history of Oh Boy, sort of told by a lot of the people who've worked at Oh Boy, um, a lot of the artists who've been on it. Um, you know, Fiona is going to be featured heavily, mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, essentially, it's just going to tell the story of Oh Boy. Um, you know, from its start into some of the weird sort of corners of Oh Boy. Um, which we're doing for this year. We're kind of diving into some of the nooks and crannies of Oh Boy. For example, the the Bisquits um, mm. was a Nashville band who was, um, Tommy Womack was in it and Mike Grimes, uh, the owner of Grimey's. Okay. And it was this total just like garage band. I think they like, the stories that they all got kicked out of their uh, their bands and they formed this group. And I guess Al and John took took to them and released their one record, um, which we're putting out on vinyl for the first time oh, uh, wow. this year. And so, you know, I think uh, part of it is to shine some light on Oh Boy and not necessarily just the John Prine story. John Prine is a, you know, integral part 
of oh boy obviously but yeah yeah it's very interesting you know there's some other stories in there that probably don't get the light shown on them enough um throughout the years you know todd snyder released some of his you know biggest records on oh boy records hmm. um which a lot of people don't know uh you know dan reader has <laughs> dan reader has a, a story all all to himself um he's an interesting dude so you know we're, we're excited to kind of shine light on those stories um yeah because it's, it's very surprising history, oh boy. that's that's yeah. not a john prine documentary Exactly. Yeah, it's not a John Prine documentary. I mean, yeah. he'll be a part of it for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, he was the president for you know forty years, uh, yeah. but he, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be sort of an O Boy documentary and explore some of the employees, uh, people who worked with O Boy, um, and a lot of a lot of the artists and uh, records we've put out because we've we've done a lot through the years um, that I think probably a lot of people uh, don't know about. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, we do our best to get people too, but you know, the average, the you know, the average person just thinks John Prine's label, or if they know it at all. <laughs> well, and, and I, I'm trying to think of a, how to say this sensitive, sensitively, but like you know, with John's passing, it's it is an opportunity for people to to look back at, at his catalog, but also at the label, and and hopefully for a new season of the label to begin uh, and some new interests, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that's right. Um, what does the? Uh, oh, by the way, when I was watching that documentary trailer, mm-hmm. I loved the the origin of the name. Oh boy, how it's like yeah, it can be used for good things and when something goes right and when something goes wrong. <laughs> that's so. That's so true. I love. I, I can yeah. relate with that so much. <laughs> And that's you know oh that's boy, the, oh boy oh boy yeah <laughs> I feel like that's just the nature of artists too you know it's right, like we right. wake up one day we don't sell any records nobody cares about our pitches and then the next day we get covered somewhere it's like just highs and lows all the time uh-huh. yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> so what is what does the future look like uh, for the label moving forward we have the documentary and then uh, uh, what are the what are the plans. Yeah. So, um, you know, all of our artists are active, um, you know, making music and, um, we're, we're really excited about that and excited about all the artists we have on our label. Um, we're excited to sign new people. Um, you know, John's catalog is, um, just a well to, to dig into. And that's, you know, that's a lot of my job is, um, I run everything with physical, um, so making CDs, making vinyl, uh, merchandise and specifically this year. Um, not only is it the 40 year anniversary of Oh Boy, but it's the 50 year anniversary of John Prine's self titled. Okay, and so do you have access to the his records on the other labels? How does that work? Right. So it's you know it's a bit strange. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of you know talks between lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> um, we don't, we don't own, you know, the, the, the asylum records, nor do we own the, uh, Atlantic records. I see. They, they own those. Sure. Um, so we, yeah, we focus on the Oh Boy catalog, but John has done re-recordings. Souvenirs is a record in particular that was, um, recorded that last year we put out on vinyl, um, after John passed, you know, it was this greatest hits and re-recorded songs, oh, which cool. is beautiful. Um, yeah, in a lot of ways, it you know, in, in my opinion, it feels like he grows into a lot of them almost. Mm. Um, some of those songs from the first record, you know, sung from with like his you know older voice, yeah, uh, oh, sure. re- resonate. But yeah, he, um, he 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 all all the oh boy records essentially is what we have. Um, but the 50 year anniversary of John Prine will be big. Um, putting out, you know, if, I'd eventually love to see all of John Prine's Oh Boy catalog on vinyl. Yeah, absolutely. Slowly but surely, you know. I mean, that's uh, got to be hard, right? For records in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Some of those yeah. tapes may be destroyed or whatnot. Yeah, it's luckily we have a pretty good, um, uh, pretty good, like, backup of everything. And most of the tapes and stuff are good. in a secure sort of uh, lockup place. Um, here in Nashville, so oh, I've actually been going back and forth to there to do some of that right uh, this week. Crazy, that's fun. But that's a yeah, fun so, process. 
It, it is. Yeah, it, it, it will be a lot of fun. And there's a lot of great people here in Nashville. We use, um, we've been using infrasonic sounds um, for vinyl mastering and stuff like that. And they're, they're great. Um, yeah, that's, you, that's you the town to be in, I'm sure, for that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but so, yeah, I mean, between, between John's catalog and some real special stuff this year with the 50-year 50, 50 anniversary of uh, that, which, which we will be doing stuff for, um, there's, there's, so, there's so much uh, to, to get excited about. And I think it being the 40 years kind of gives us a new taking off point, uh, which, is, which is really exciting. Well, uh, but sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, but um, yes, we'll, we'll we'll certainly be moving forward. Our artists are all active, and uh, we'll we'll be signing more artists soon. One of the things that interests me about labels like this is oh, you have train, by the way. Oh, that is quite loud. Yeah, a little bit loud. Yeah, you're not kidding. Yeah, <laughs> and does, does that does that come through uh, at like uh, a few times a day or? Uh, yeah. A few yeah. times, maybe maybe three or four times a day. Yeah, <laughs> you don't have a recording studio there, do you? No, luckily. No. Uh, one <laughs> of the one of the things that interests me about labels like this is is you have the ability to essentially release. This is what we're talking about: release a reissue or a B-sides project from John Prine once a week if you wanted to. And, and some fans would buy everything. They couldn't help themselves. Uh, I'm like that with artists. Uh, but you have to be careful you don't take advantage of these fans, don't you? Sure. Uh, th and that's a huge part of it. I think, you know, there's there's a pretty... Uh, there's a pretty big amount... A, a, a big group of people who essentially will buy anything John Prine. Yeah. But we're, you know, we're we're certainly conscious of what we're releasing and not doing, you know, we're nothing we're doing is um, you know, a like a gimmick to make money. I think everything we've released is stuff that people have truly wanted. And I think you see that with um, you know, I run all the e-commerce and it's it's pretty easy to see that you know, the, the, the things that we put out last year, you know, we put souvenirs out on vinyl um, and we put John Prine Live out on vinyl. And, you know, we did a D to C um, variant that was super special and mm -hmm. immediate, you know, immediately sold, you know, 2,000 of them. Amazing. Uh, within yeah. like three days. Wow. You know, and so it's, it's, I don't think we've done anything yet that is, um, you know, feels a little like gimmicky. Yeah. I think there's no, so much to reach into that, you know, no one, I don't think any serious John Prime fan feels like their collection's totally complete, you know? Right. And, and, and the next thing will be something that, uh, you know, feels, feels like it's not adding something to it. And so that's the idea is that everything we do and even, even merchandise stuff, I feel like is to add to someone's sort of John Prime collection. Yeah. Um, I just feel like it's such a delicate balance, you know, because... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you could just release all yeah, the iPhone right. demos and <laughs> there's probably tapes and tapes of everything. Yeah, there there is a lot, and and honestly, is as far as that goes, like as far as B sides, um, John once proposed a uh, just as an aside, John once proposed a slogan for Oh Boy is uh, no B sides. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, he doesn't believe yeah, in them. Which, he, what does he think? They're all A sides, or does he think? Yeah, that he thinks they're all A sides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but uh, what what I was saying was that the uh, the the stuff we we have released is you know a lot of final reissues. Um, we did we did put out some stuff that allowed us to get some of John's earlier uh, catalog tracks. So the mm. singing mailman delivers. Um, is one that is live recordings and very early demos of that mm. first, like two, I think maybe three records, demos from that first three uh, set. So we, we've done some of that. And some of that was to, you know, capture um, like Angel for Montgomery. You know, it's, it's, it's nice to have some of those on Oh Boy. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and, and John being the president of it. I mean, you look at like what Taylor Swift's doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. You know, it's a similar thing on, you know, not not so wild of a scale, but yeah, um, it's good to have those, and and a lot of them are different enough to where they sound, um, they they feel like a, a new addition to a collection. But no, there there is a line. I, I agree. I think we could keep putting out John stuff forever, um, 
but we we want to be conscious of putting out quality products and i think we've been good about that yeah and and i think you know i'm an advocate for the more the better you know for an artist mm, who was for, yeah i mean it's to me it's like live stuff bootlegs whatever the you know the the demos uh, i think i remember um after Johnny Cash passed, I know that they did a couple releases, um, some official releases, and then they started digging into the archives. And I remember they did some uh, of his kind of like tape. Uh, they found some tape recordings that they remastered yeah. some of his demos. Yeah, I'm just I'm such a fan of that. Like I, you know, you love to hear it, especially back in the '80s and '90s. Um, there wasn't really a place for that kind of stuff. Everything was so polished and so well presented by the major labels. So to, for us as fans to get to hear that type of intimacy, I'm all for it. I agree. Yeah, I, you know, with an artist like John or some of my favorites, you know, I'm, I'm a huge Leonard Cohen fan and I just, mm. I have everything you could consume by him. Like, really? <laughs> you know, I just, I just, yeah. I mean, there's, there's no, there's no end. I just, and it and it's it's not like I've never I've never bought in like a live record and been like man I don't know if this one was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. If it's uh, if it's someone that you absolutely love, there's just nothing in your collection that that bothers you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I think I think where where we're coming from is that as long as we can put out stuff that you know is is um, is worth. Uh, you know, worth buying and, 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 you know, sounds as good as it can. Um, and the quality is nice and gives, you know, gives fans some sort of, uh, link to, oh boy. And, you know, feeling like part of the big family, then we'll, we'll put it out. Yeah. You know, it's funny you brought up Leonard Cohen. Cause I was just thinking about him a co- when we first started talking. Cause I was, I was mm-hmm. thinking about when Pace Magazine used to do like the greatest living songwriters. And yeah. I, I'm thinking about like the songwriters, the people at the top of that list that we've lost in the in the past couple of years with Tom Petty and John and Leonard, like it, it's pretty crazy mm-hmm. how that list has changed recently. It, yeah, it, it it really is. I I agree. I mean, uh, that's you know part of part of me working at Oh Boy was just a deep appreciation for songwriting, and so I've certainly felt it. You know, it's 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 tough losing all those people because there has been a lot. How emotional was it when when John passed last year, and just with the global response to to his death? Yeah, it. it I mean, it, it was awful um, mm-hmm. for you know for so many reasons. Um, you know, I think John had a lot more to do. Yeah, um, and I think he he you know he was on the road. He was in Europe um, on tour. Wow. You know, wow. he he had just played for the first time. Paris and sold out. That was his last show. Wow. Um, yeah, he'd always wanted to play Paris and he sold out a show and he did hurt his leg. So he, he was like, he played it sitting down, but he's like, I'm still doing it. I'm still going to play this <laughs> show. And he did. And that, you know, that was, um, then he, you know, he came home um, and not long after passed away, but it, it was, it was really emotional. Um, the, the hardest part was not getting to do the big wild party that should have happened when John so I hadn't thought of that oh my gosh yeah yeah that's the worst part is that Nashville would have mourned and they did mourn with us and you know it was nice to have that um that you know sense of community um, and the world the world too but Nashville's always so good to us and um you know, the, it, it, Nashville had just been hit by this horrible tornado that destroyed a lot of the neighborhoods oh, that, like right. I live in. And yeah. yeah, so it, you know, Nashville was kind of, it, we all kind of came together in whatever way we could. Um, and I think every, you know, that was nice. But what, what was really tough for me, um, was not getting to sort of have that big celebration of John's life that he would have wanted. And, and I think his family would have wanted. And, um, I never so thought many of that. People yeah, so many people looked up to John. I mean, Sturgill, Jason Isbell, oh, yeah. Dan Auerbach, Amanda Shire, you know, all oh, of these 100%. people were yeah. Yeah. Yeah, huge, huge John fans and and friends. I mean, good friends of John. Mm. Um, and, you know, I just know that if it weren't for this COVID situation that we would have had these massive benefit shows and not uh-huh. benefit shows, but, um, oh, yeah. you know, celebration of life. Yes. And, yeah. uh, oh, yeah. We didn't get to have those. And that was really hard. I never, uh, that, that was tough. never even that, thought about that. that. Yeah. Oh man. You know, I often you hear a lot about the funerals that weren't able to be in just in the in the world in general. 
Um, but those, uh, for some of these iconic um, characters, it, you really, it's really sad that uh, that they missed out on that. Yeah, That's yeah, really it'll happen. Sad. It'll happen. Sure. Well, yeah, you know, eventually it, it will, and it's going to be wild, and hopefully as wild as it would have been. I think it will be. Um, we're all going to have a big party. Yeah, but that's it, great. It's, it's tough to have to wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's good that it's still in the in in the plans. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, when we're talking about the the people who would have come to celebrate, uh, you know, what's interesting about John is that not every seventy year old artist from the seventies and eighties finds a way to connect with the future generations, and like most don't. W- why do you think John was able to? connect with new and and younger fans i mean i remember the first time i heard about him was in paste and it was with around the fair and square time and Mm. uh you know it's just that's where he came on my radar and and artists who were my age songwriters were talking about him i remember josh ritter talking about him there's a lot you know people loved him uh how did he do that how did he continue to have this career continue to build respect you don't see that all the time yeah, he he cared about songwriting and music. Mm. I, I think that really is what it comes down to. I mean, in, in the simplest form, he just cared deeply about music and songwriting, and he was active. You yeah, know, he, he it wasn't true. it wasn't as if he loved his old school country music, but he also loved hearing like Jason Isbell. And when he did, he you know caught on real quick. Same with Sturgill. Mm. Um, you know, same with Kelsey Walden, Arlo McKinley. He, you know, he, he was active and he cared deeply about, um, that. And these, you know, these people turns out like John Prine is the hero of all this whole generation of Americana that, you know, the, the Sturgill Simpsons, Jason Isbell's, um, you know, and the Josh Ritters, even of the sort of early 2000s. Yeah. Um, the Avett brothers, you know, all, yeah. all of those guys looked up and covered John Prine. Um, Old Crow. And I think, you know, I think with John's touring, um, it also helped because he was constantly touring. Um, and he was adamant about getting, you know, these smaller acts to open for him. Oh, uh, that's um, So, you know, Kelsey... Uh, um, not Kelsey Walden. Uh, Casey Musgraves opened for him probably wow. four times um back in the day you sure. know uh, yeah w- w- i went to a bunch of those shows and um they you know they were awesome and they'd always sing together and that was his other thing is that they'd almost always do a song together um so they connected both on the fact that they might be on the road and they connected and john would almost always bring one of the artists for a song and paradise when he played live it was like required that everyone come on stage that's great yeah, so he 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 involved people in um, his live shows, and I think that helped a lot. But I think the what what it really comes down to is he just still cared a lot about what was being made um, I, in and, the moment. Yeah, and that's a good point. And and being active because we see a lot of artists at that age where they're living in Miami or they're and they're golfing every day. Exactly. You know, and yeah. so I think for the younger people, when we look at that, there's just immense respect. And then there's also just that like beacon of hope that's like, I hope I'm still relevant. I hope I'm still making art uh, when I'm that age. Yeah. Yeah. That was, it was a lot of fun getting to see um, the Tree of Forgiveness come out and be, you know, John's Mm. most commercially successful record and Mm -hmm. getting to work on that and seeing how just he was so excited. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. So psyched. Yeah. He was so psyched. That's good to uh, hear. You would think you'd be kind of like uh, uh, desensitized to success. Nope, nope. But amazing. That's- he was so excited about it, and he loved. Um, he he loved you know getting all these all these younger people uh, coming into the fold. Uh, he 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 was he was a huge fan of it. I think it impressed him a lot. I think the other thing when I listen to that record too, it reminds me of of the. Johnny Cash, Rick Rubin stuff, and I, I think there w- there's the reason why John has resonated with younger people is that you can just hear that authenticity in this in the songwriting yes. and and even just in the production. I think if some if you know if you were to put that record on and it just felt like it was uh, you know recorded in 
at London and LA without him present. And then he just showed up to sing, <laughs> sing over top of it, which are, you know, a lot of artists at, at that stage in their career do. Um, <clears throat> it's just <clears throat> that, you know, you can just hear him right through the microphone. Yeah. And, and, and Dave Cobb, um, who produced that record with John, I mean, he, he did an incredible job of that. Mm. Uh, yeah, Dave, Dave is an amazing producer. And I think really, really brought that out. They, they, they knocked it out of the park as far as authenticity goes and just having John be at the front of that record. Cause he was certainly front and center. Yeah. Oh, it's so great. How, how long have you been at the label? I've worked here since I started as an intern. I was in college in 2015 um, and I love the intern story. I love the intern yep, to full time yeah. employee. Oh, it's great man to president. I <laughs> I, cold, I cold called Oh Boy Records. Really? Yeah. Good for you. Yep. You yep, hear that, yeah, everyone? That's, a great story. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you do yeah, it. If you want a job at a record label? Try calling. It's very easy. Bert. Just call up. <laughs> get yourself a Yellow Pages. <laughs> call them up. Yeah. Um, it, it was, it, yeah, it was great. So I've, I've been there I you were, as an intern. You were in college? I'm, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was in college. Okay. Uh-huh. And you were, were you in Nashville? I was in Nashville. Okay. Uh, I was at Belmont. Bel- I was going to, I was going to guess that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. At the time, Belmont, uh, what, uh, Belmont and Oh Boy Records were on the same street. Oh. It was out of a one bedroom apartment. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> cause they, it, everything kind of cooled down. Um, for a couple years after Albanetta died, John's longtime manager. Okay. Um, John only had had that one manager for his whole life, and Al had died, and he was a co owner in Oh Boy. And so there was a little bit of we're not sure where this is going to go, but John um, wanted it to be a family label, and he was psyched. And I, J- apparently, Jody and Fiona told him that he had to put out a new record. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. He did, which I think we were all glad about, including him. But I came on sort of right at the very beginning of that. Um, I think that's why. I mean, I called like a few days after they had gotten their first employee, Eileen, um, and was just like, hey, any, any anything I can do to help? And I think it just allowed me to uh, sort of stake my place. I The first thing I did was I started making posters for every show, Um, not making them myself, but sort of organizing local artists in each city to design something. Um, And then I got essentially involved. Now I'm the director of e-commerce and production Mm. um, for like anything physical. And so, uh, you know, that I just kind of staked it there and then built off of built off of that. But that's that's been my role since I've been around is sort of that side of things, um, which That's I love. I, I love vinyl. Um, big, big fan of vinyl and uh, artist merchandise and stuff. I always have been. So, Well, you know what? Uh, we, this is all of our listeners and the people um, who we've had on the show. Is And I just think about your job of, of finding these archive tapes all the way, mm. you mm. know, to six months or 12 months later when they sell out online. You know, I mean, that's just... What an incredible process it's, from... It, yeah, <laughs> I'm just jealous. Man, that's, a, that's <laughs> funny. I've never thought about it in that context, but you're totally right. Holy shit, it puts it into well, this and the, weird, like, yeah, it comes from a box in a, like, storage unit somewhere off the highway <laughs> and turns into, like, a record that's being distributed in, uh, you know, indie record stores all around the world. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. And it's then cool. you plus, cool. plus 50, 100 years when people are, you know... Uh, taking them out of their grandpa's yeah exactly yeah Yeah. no Uh it's so incredible so you're involved with the pressing process and all of that uh in in a a, you know sort of uh project management way oh that's what Uh, i meant yeah 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 exactly yeah no Um, that's we work with lots of different uh plants all you know around america and depending on projects bigger ones or smaller ones there's nothing Um, like getting a this happened to me yesterday but there's nothing like getting a, mm -hmm. a record in the mail from the plant and taking it out and hoping it's the right record, but taking it out and putting it on the turntable and, and listening to it. The whole process of project managing, I find so uh, painful and stressful. So <laughs> props to you, but like I just responded to an email. I said, no, not that label, this label, please. Don't move that over here. Right. Wrong color. That whole process is, and I actually just paid a bill for $2.69 uh-huh. because I changed the paper 
uh, the, uh, like selection on on something, and they're like, "Well, that's going to affect right. your invoice, so please, it's, yeah, pay it's, the balance." Uh, getting that final project, uh, <laughs> getting that final product is always real scary. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> thinking there's some sort of like you know, there's a typo or oh, oh yeah, yeah. Luckily, luckily, nothing too horrible has happened. Um, there was a there was a, a little bit of the pressing of uh, John Prine live that it was a double LP uh-huh. and. The first side was fine. The second side, though, was a uh, the weekend LP. Oh man! So they got so the stampers like, mix, mixed up. You know, up. this was kind of cool. I don't, I, you know, I, I don't really listen to this music, but I don't think this is right. <laughs> Wouldn't that be really weird? <laughs> that, oh man! <laughs> I cannot imagine. So that was Getting like that in the mail. That was the plants' mistake. How many of those were made? It not many. I think it was okay. it was probably one box. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, it was probably a it was probably a box of records, and it you know no no biggie. That's crazy. Uh, I wonder what goes in, uh, what's involved in a plant for like double checking that. Just because I've seen a plant and I've seen how quickly they move with like label puck label yeah. press go go go, and I'm you know nowadays they're under um, you know huge demand so. It's insane. I know. And, How did they with not the shut down last year? I don't think things are caught up. No, still right. I still don't think things are caught up. So, and I imagine the plants yeah. are also uh, operating. If you're waiting on a Oh Boy Records release. Just you know, hold tight. Right. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to get it out there to you as fast as we can. How long did they shut down in in America? Like, I mean, how long was like United like absolutely closed back back in March? Do you know? It, I mean, it was like. Gosh, it, it feels like the the actual per, you know production um, factory sort of line stuff was closed. I feel like most of April and May. I think for sure, and and I know that I know that other ones that we used were closed longer for sure. Wow. Um, I don't know in particular. I know for a fact that most of them were almost every one of them was closed through April um, mm. and into May for sure, and then. You know, it would be, you know, I, I got stuff as far as, as soon as, you know, I remember getting emails that said, as soon as we open, it's about, you know, nine to 12 weeks from then. Wow. Well, you yeah. know, you know what was sad? You would know this better than me, but it, it, mm-hmm. I felt like they were getting, that pressing plants as a whole in North America were getting their lead times much smaller over the past 10 years. I felt like they were getting a hold of it. More and more plants opening up. I think the times yeah. are getting better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just we, we, we got, yeah, we got, we got a little spoiled for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they were, they were getting quicker. Um, you know, and, and th- that had its issues too. I think with quality, it, it certain, you know, oh, certain really? places. Um, yeah. I mean, not, not to name, name no, anyone, no. but you know, I think, I think for sure that, you know, with, the, the increase in demand there certainly was a uh, you know um, qu- quality suffered a little bit and so as, as long as you're making sure that test pressing sound good and yeah, um, yeah. you know all that you're you're probably okay but there's you know there's certainly been issues with it um, luckily we've never had something major but I, I do know people have had some nightmare scenarios well listen I would say that a John Prine slash weekend record is is something major. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be worth a ton of money if, if you, you know, know what in, in on discogs it's oh, gonna be worth thousands. <laughs> that's right. Because I was thinking you would have to keep it unopened for it to be worth a lot, but you wouldn't know. Like, how would you know? How would you know? But I, I, I remember um a long time ago there was this like uh-huh. um a punk band who had like a Pete Seeger C D in the in the jewel case, but I but you would never be able to prove that because you could just right. swap it out, right? But you couldn't definitely with the vinyl. Nobody could could do that at home. You, you couldn't just. I don't, yeah, like you're I don't saying, know side A was John know. Prine and side B was the weekend. It wasn't like disc one and disc two. No, 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 no. It was it was LP one was John Prine. LP oh, two was. The oh, okay. That's yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes it. And even the labels were the labels the weekend. Yeah, the label. I mean, it was like it, one of the le- the weekend one was like a like fluorescent blue, and ha- oh, you know, it, it, it was a totally stuffing. Different. It was a stuffing problem then. It was a yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I should have okay. been more clear. I was, was imagining like problem. two different like stampers, like 
<laughs> oh my gosh, that would have been way better. <laughs> like no, a split. No, it a was, split they opened inch. it up and they had a weekend record. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Right, okay. Right. All right. All right. Hey, listen, thank you so much for doing this. I'm going to go to Discogs now and try to get one of those, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, of course, man. Thanks so much for having me on. I, I, I know I've mentioned it to you, but y'all's uh, y'all's um, stuff online has been has been so helpful to me. I've, I've used it before. Oh, that's great to hear. Thank you all for listening, and thanks to Colin for being on the show. What a fun chat. Go to oboy.com. It's a very simple name. I wish I had thought of it first, um, but I wasn't around that early in the 80s. But anyway, go to oboy.com. Uh, to check out the releases, get something from them, um, and, and stay up to date to see what they come up with next. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool story, a really interesting um, story with, with their label. Also, visit our website, otherrecordlabels.com. You can check out the new book there. You can also check out our free toolkit, which is a free download. All of our resources there at otherrecordlabels.com or otherrecordlabels.com slash toolkit to get the toolkit. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for being a subscriber. Please leave a review and, and, and tell a friend about the show.